Hello again. So at a local or city level, we have options ranging from charging for parking, congestion charging, implementing emission-free zones and land value capture. Some of these options are readily implementable while others require to be embedded into projects. Parking is something we find everywhere in many of our cities. Motorists take parking for granted and traditional planning also taught us that cars need to have parking places, so we need to provide parking for cars. In cities where motorcycles are dominant, you will see the same happening with motorcycle parking. Often many cities overlook parking, especially on-street parking, as a viable source of funding. Imagine parking spaces provided in prime localities of your city. The space occupied by a parked car is worth a lot more than the parking charge that the car pays for a day. Properly pricing parking will influence vehicle use. And studies have shown that increased parking pricing, especially reduces the vehicle use to that area. And in commercial areas, properly priced parking with incremental prices can increase the utilization rate of space as more cars will be able to use the space because cars will not be parked for long. For local businesses, this is actually a benefit because the potential clientele coming to the area will increase if there is parking space available. So with efficient pricing, we are able to use the existing parking spaces efficiently instead of building additional parking spaces. I stress on the properly priced parking here, and this is because in most of our cities, parking is either free or way underpriced. A thing to remember also when pricing parking is that the cost of hourly on-street parking needs to be higher than the cost of a single journey public transport ticket. The reason? If parking is priced more than the public transport fare, this could trigger a shift to public transport. But of course, provided that the public transport serves the destination and is also of good quality and is reliable. You may have seen these characteristics of a good public transport system in our video on public transport in earlier sections. If you find parking pricing or parking management interesting, don't forget to see the reading material in the reading list section of this course. And there are some interesting papers and research done by Professor Donald Shoup, Professor Paul Barter and Todd Littman on the issue of parking and on travel demand management or mobility management in general. And now that we have properly priced our parking and got the additional revenue and we have invested that into sustainable transport and also on the long term reclaimed urban space, how does the future look like? To know this, let's see an example from Copenhagen. Welcome to Nyhaven. It's a district in Copenhagen, now a very famous tourist destination. It was not always that beautiful. There was a time when this district was seen as a dangerous area and then motorization happened all over Europe and the district was also filled with cars. And yes, Copenhagen was not always the haven for bicycles. There was a time, especially in the 60s, where many of the European cities, including Copenhagen, were influenced by personal automobiles and walking and cycling lost their priority. And over time, there was a clear shift in priorities that made Copenhagen a city for cyclists. So coming back to our discussion on parking, over time, the parking situation in Copenhagen and in Nyhaven was tamed and Nyhaven looks like this today. It's a popular tourist destination, as I mentioned, and people come to this area to sit outside, have a coffee or a beer. It's a pedestrian area and you can see cyclists walking their bicycles, people sitting outside to enjoy the sun and the canal still serves for sightseeing boats. But was parking pricing alone responsible for this? Well, the answer is not entirely. This transformation is a part of a larger set of activities that the city took to create car-free areas. For a period of time, 
the city gradually reduced the number of parking spaces and other spaces for cars and allocated these spaces back to the people in form of pedestrian areas, bicycle lanes and green spaces. And this meant a reduction of 2 to 3% of parking spaces annually for cars. Over the long term, doing so increased the space available for people sixfold. That is between 1962 to 1996, a span of 34 years, the space available for people increased from 16,000 square meters to 96,000 square meters. Another example for making motorists pay is the congestion charge scheme of London, or simply known as the sea charge. The scheme was introduced in 2003 by then mayor Ken Livingston. It was heavily criticized at the start, and yet it still exists. The idea of the congestion charge is simple. Cars entering the central part of London or the charging zone must pay a fee as there is too much traffic clogging these parts of London. Before the scheme started, the city lost about two to four million pounds every week in terms of time loss due to congestion. And as of April 2002, vehicles entering the congestion zone pay about 15 pounds a day. The scheme works throughout the year, but at different times. Weekends and on bank holidays, the scheme is active only from midday until 6 p.m. And on weekdays, it is active from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Traffic cameras installed along the periphery of the congestion zone record the number plates of the vehicles entering the zone and check if they are either exempt from paying the congestion, zone, uh, congestion charge or have paid the charge. If not, they are penalized. If there is a late payment, that is a payment on the next day, then there is a small penalty. And if the owners still don't pay the charge, then they are given a penalty charge notice of about 160 pounds. And just after three years of implementation, the congestion levels have dropped by 26% and the GHG emissions have dropped by 16%. People owning electric or zero emission vehicles are exempt from paying the congestion charge. And in addition to reducing the vehicular traffic in central London, the scheme also generated a net income of £224 million in 2021. An important thing to notice is that the money obtained from the congestion charge is fed into the system again in form of investments to improve the public transport network and for cycling. Also, there is one central agency that in this case is Transport for London or TFL, who is responsible for the congestion charge uh, scheme. And having one agency streamlines the decision making process and it's easier to implement actions. So congestion charging is clearly an additional revenue source for cities to promote sustainable transport. Land value capture is an increasingly popular mechanism implemented in cities in emerging economies. The value of land often depends on its location and its purpose. Land parcels that are well connected and that are in locations accessible to various other users have a higher value. The connections and the amenities do not automatically happen, but are rather created by the planning agencies acting in the interest of the public. This increase in land value due to the intervention of the public entities is called the betterment. So the capturing of the increase in land value is at the core of land value capture. Land value capture is a concept rather than policy, and it can be interpreted in various ways. For the sake of our discussion, we would term land value capture as a means for local authorities to capture some of the profit that public transport investments are likely to create and invest these profits to finance better public transport. Land value capture can be effectively used for constructing public transport projects such as metros and bus rapid transit projects and these projects improve the connectivity of the land parcel 
And as we said earlier, higher connectivity means increase in price. In addition, mixed use planning around the parcel can increase the accessibility, thus attracting investments and residents. So properly implementing land value capture can encourage commercial development along the corridor and encourage transit oriented development, which is land use and transport integration with public transport as the focus. Private railways in Tokyo have implemented land value capture by developing real estate and the railway construction together. A part of the railway construction was financed by the profits from real estate development. The Metro Rail Company in Hong Kong, which is also the public transport authority, also implements land value capture. The city government in Hong Kong sells public land to the Metro Rail Company and the transport authority either sells or leases the land. The price of sale or lease includes the future price due to the public transport development. So the profit is then used by the transport operator to build and operate better transport infrastructure. Yet some common pitfalls in land value capture implementation are the lack of political support, the lack of enough data about the, uh, the land, land prices, and also the lack of enough staff capacity, be it the technical capacity of the staff or the number of staff assigned for the land value capture project. And it is also best when land value capture and land use planning go hand in hand with the local government. Don't forget to read uh, the list of resources in of the section on land value capture if land value capture is of interest for you. In the next video, we'll talk more about the instruments that are available at the national level. So see you soon.